Hi, and welcome to Pop and Lock. I'm Natalie Dalzicki. In the Nevertheless She Persisted era, I am joined by Elizabeth Nolan Brown, an associate editor at Reason, and two of my colleagues here at Libertarianism.org, our senior producer and resident doula in training, Tess Terrible, and our marketing manager, Marianne March. Thanks for joining me, everyone. Thanks for having us. Hello. So imagine this. Reproduction rates are plummeting, and women at large are having trouble conceiving children. In the Republic of Gilead, a totalitarian theocratic state that replaced the United States of America, the answer to this problem is to institute childbearing slavery. I mean, heaven forbid women aren't popping out babies as frequently as possible, right? The few women who can conceive in Gilead are forced to reproduce on behalf of the elite who cannot. They are called handmaids. There are many elements, layers, and clapbacks to The Handmaid's Tale that we will unpack, but what the show does an impressive job of is developing ruthless characters like Aunt Lydia, while showcasing resilient and calculated characters like Alfred, also known as June. The show really is unique in its time, but what is probably most concerning is that this future dystopia that looks a whole lot like the 1600s is all too real feeling. I couldn't help but think, what if, while I was watching many episodes. So let's start out there. Were there any scenes that stuck out to you guys as particularly eerie because you couldn't, you could realistically see this happening or maybe tweaking some parts of the scene and then you could see it happening or scenes that simply stuck out to you? Off the top of my head, it wasn't particularly eerie, but the scene where June is at the hospital and the nurse is critiquing her parenting for sending her to school, that was so close to reality. I see mothers being shamed all the time, and I don't think that's totally out of... Mm. Yeah, that's I mean, that scene is, you know, for people who don't watch the show, it especially the first season, but throughout the three seasons, it goes back and forth between June's life now in the Republic of Gilead, this dystopian society, and then, you know, it goes back to her time before that. Um, a lot of it, like, just right leading up beforehand, and that's the scene she mentioned with the kids. And I was also going to say, like, a scene from that period of time, because... I think that's the most frightening when we get into the actual, you know, established Gilead. It's it's too out there for now. But you see these things in in the you know time period they had leading up that are that are very scary. And I think the biggest one for me was um the one it was in the first season. There was a season with a. a scene with protesters and they were out just you know and there was the line of riot cops there with their horses and their shields and all their crap and you know and the protesters were shouting but not being violent and you've seen the, and the, the cops start shouting back and like you've seen this scene so many times in the past few years especially but just over and over again like I've been there during that thing we expect even if the cops get rough and maybe you know go out of bounds we don't expect them to just let loose and and you know it shows all of a sudden one of the cops fires out a bullet and then they all just start firing out bullets in this scene and they start just gunning down the protesters and june and her friend have to run away and all of them are running away and people are just literally getting shot and i think that that really sticks out because that isn't even necessarily like a big systemic thing it's like just sort of if one cop you know loses his head in fires and then other people start and that's sort of how it looked like but then it was like a thing you couldn't go back from you can't go back from that when that happens as a society i think the show's creators do a really good job of um kind of blurring the lines between our world that we're watching handmaids and uh the pre the not their present day but what used to be the present day that looks a lot like what the time we're living in now i remember one of the first episodes is a includes a flashback where June is first realizing she's pregnant with her baby Hannah and she's trying to get an Uber. And when she said she's trying to get an Uber, I was just like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I'm from Boston. So like he just hearing her say stuff like, Oh, I need to take the train to Boston or, or something like that. And, um, even when, um, her and all the women, stop working when they institute the law that no women can work anymore. It's really interesting to see that there's not, I mean, her office that she's working in that they show in the flashback that she's working in, it looks like a normal office that any of us have been in. I think the show's creators kind of make that purposeful parallel to our world to kind of say this could happen here. This isn't, um, you know, we're not that far separated from the world they're living in. I think particularly for me, and I'm going to jump ahead to season three, but one of the scenes that really stuck out to me, um, partially because I 
really like the character of Aunt Lydia. I can't say I really like her, but I really like her character and her character development. Um, but was when we were finally getting background on her, which like for the first two seasons, I was like, where, like, where, like she's central to this, to this story. Where is she, where's, she, where's her background at? But, um, I was, I really liked how they developed it into a sense that we're looking at her as a teacher, which, which that definitely could fit like the mold of her personality now. Like you can see how she's very bossy and authoritative. Um, but she's like a elementary school teacher, I think third, fourth grade ish. And, um, she like really cares for her students and like is interested in making sure they like the one student, um, her, the parent, his mother was a late picking her, picking him up from school and the moms didn't have dinner ready for him. And they were having a conversation and Lydia was like, Oh, you can just come over to my house or chili. Like she was really trying to engage and make sure her students were like well fed and like had parents that were looking out for them. But at the same time, like I guess, we didn't get a time span, but shortly thereafter, um, Lydia, as the teacher, was deciding that like his mother was not fit enough to like take care of him and have a careful watch over him. So she was like, she had reported it to to authorities. Um, and the child was taken away from the mother. And I think that was kind of like the line where you're like, oh, like I had an expectation of how this relationship was. And then then you can quickly see how we got to Gilead after that. So I think like that was one of those scenes for me. I was like, oh, like there's just these small things that are lining up. And then that's making it um, even more. Gilead seem even more like they are just a bunch of small steps. that, And then all of a sudden yeah, we had. Possible. Yeah, <laughs> it shows you how like people, the two sides of sort of this Christian charity idea, like the, Aunt Lydia started off trying to be like, OK, like this mom maybe isn't doing the best with this kid because they show her sort of, you know, having to work too much or whatever. But I understand that I'll empathize with her and I'll try to help out directly on my own. Like, you know, and then versus I'm just going to call in some authority to, to deal with this, which is. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just almost harrowing in a way what a normal liberal progressive society they live in that, you know, looks a lot like our own society in the United States, I think Handmaid's very purposely showcases um, a lot, a very diverse cast, you know, individuals that are representative as gay. Uh, June herself was in an interracial relationship. And so we, we see what looks very similar to our version of normal and and even looks quite pleasant. I mean, she has her best friends. She has kind of a kooky mom. She has a great um, marriage with this guy, and she was um, able to have a child in an area era that um, childbearing has become quite difficult. So I think um, I think it kind of like relaxes you in a way and it, like you it kind of tricks you in saying oh this is a good moral society where individuals have their freedom and they are they have you know rights and kind of tricks you into like not seeing the trickle down of what brings us to Gilead. Yeah. I think this would be like a good time to talk about like what what brought us to Gilead. Like what what um whether it be a mindset or how did they create this republic, so they call it, um into um what we see in the show. So I'll, in my opinion a lot of it is religion based um using religion puritanism um as a as a form to control people but i was kind of wondering what how you guys thought we got to gilead from like the background scenes we see of like what is seemingly today's world are not far from it well, it seems to be that it happened in inches, that it was a slow progression of first, there's more involvement of state actors into people's lives and judging people as parents. And then when the scene we saw where June loses her job and all women lose their jobs, and it seems that there's a turning point at some point um, and a war, there's allusions to a crusade. Mm -hmm. And Given that there's so few people, I mean, the United States today is hundreds of millions of people, and that size of population just doesn't work in this narrative. So there had to be had to have been great loss of life at some point. And I think when the dust settled, there was a theocracy in place. I think it's interesting that it obviously is a, a, a fundamentalist religious society, but they don't just harp on that. Um, you know, they don't just make them these sort of one dimensional or almost luckily they, I don't, I don't think they make them feel like it's a 
political allegory for now. And I think that was more what I haven't actually read the original book, but um, I think that was more when the book was written in, in the 80s, you know, like the, the fundamental religious like televangelists and stuff, Tammy Faye Baker were just all part of were much more mainstream back then. Right. And I think that was more plausible that that would be, you know, a thing. So now I like that they in the in the show they combine that religious fundamentalism but also with other things. Like one of their big things is environmentalism because apparently in this society, you know, they say that all sorts of th- all sorts of I don't, they don't actually explain what, well, but like <laughs> a lot of the environment is just crap and they're trying and so a big part of this of this, you know, sort of we say conservative, I guess, but they're also what we think of as progressive in many ways. And they're like, you know, there's the scene in the last season where Fred is driving through the countryside and talking about how it all used to be crap, but because they've like instituted all these environmental, it's really strict environmental measures, they've been able to turn that around. And so that's like a whole part of their, of their society too. I think another thing that's interesting, at least from a, the standpoint of whether or not it was a revolution or this part of the United States seceded and now has uh, Gilead is that throughout the show there's no like apparent leader so we have we have commanders who are all like on various levels but there's no one person calling the shots um which i find a little uh, a bit interesting partially because like in a thor- in an authoritarian society much like this one usually you have a leader who is um embodying some sort of ideals but um, most of the, all the ideals we get are mainly through religion or um a variety of like ceremonies and practices, but there's no one person dictating that, um, which I think makes it an interesting dynamic from like a leadership perspective, but also makes the makes me kind of question how much how much buy in there is like if you're if you're following an idea versus like following a person, it's kind of harder on the lower levels of society for there to be buy in if they don't know what they're following, essentially. Yeah, I we we talked a little bit before the show about how religion plays into it. And I, I have read the book and I think Margaret Atwood is a little bit more critical of religion in the book than they are in the TV show. And I say that because there's several times in the show where June is uh, monologuing or and we hear her VO, her voiceover, and she's saying prayer in her head. And so I think the show kind of has that that balance of like any philosophy, any religion can be turned yeah. into a authoritative regime. And that's dangerous if it falls into the wrong hands, but I don't, I don't think the show at all, you know, demonizes religion. No, we, there's that beautiful scene yeah. where they're doing the baptism, and oh they, my gosh, they like yeah. contrast that with yeah. the Gilead version of religion. Yeah. But. Oh, yeah, totally. I think I think there's there's so many elements of the show that captivate religion as a beautiful part of someone's life, but it has unfortunately been interpreted into a much. Um, more uh, demonistic, you know, entity in this world. Yeah. And almost utilized as uh, to manipulate uh, people. Um, I think another thing, I mean, you would be remiss not to see all of the like the biblical references throughout the show, um, which is an, another, I think, really cool aspect of the show, but not necessarily like integral to the show. Um, for instance, you have the um, Jezebels who are working in a brothel. I um, mean, there's a lot of nods to various parts in the Bible. For instance, the ceremony when a commander um, and he has he has a wife who it cannot uh, get pregnant so they have a handmaid who um, will get p- pregnant on her behalf um, and carry her husband's child so that this family can have a child um, and es- essentially it's it's rape um, and uh, they call this the ceremony, but before they start the ceremony, each time the commander cites Genesis 30, uh, which is the story about um, Jacob and his barren wife, Rachel, um, and essentially their handmaid, Bilal, um, is able to carry a child to term for them, like on their behalf. Um, so there are a lot of instances of references, but it's not necessarily um, all that integral to the show. I, if anything, feminism and womanhood are much more integral to the show and the way the show um, is carried out. Yeah, I'd love to talk about feminism and womanhood because I think the second I, I read somewhere that the second season, the, the theme of that was motherhood. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really interesting. And rewatching the second season, I could really see that with like Serena trying to be a mother, uh, you know, 
Offred June reflecting on her time as a mother and what she's willing to sacrifice for her children. And um, there's a episode titled Women's Work, which I think is really interesting. And it, it kind of encompasses the theme that in this society and in has, I think, a lot of people that identify as the feminist would um, say women lean on each other for support in a lot of uh, difficult instances. And that's kind of the foundation of a, a progressive society. So why don't, why don't we back up for a second and explain what the role of women in the show is or like in the society, just so everyone has like a clearer picture. Um, so women are essentially categorized certain ways, um, for lack of a better word. Um, and it's usually denoted by what they're wearing. Um, and essentially there are each of them have plain dresses or plain, plainer outfits of a certain sort. Uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with, especially if you're listening to the show, <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, red um, dresses associated with handmaids. Um, and then there are also Martha's who are the housekeepers cooks um that are wear like duller outfits yeah. like a greenish gray, tone yeah, like gray. ugly grayish yeah. green yeah <laughs> um there are also like upper class wives who are dressed much like lovely teal yeah lovely teal and they they give off like a 1950s vibe 1950s 60s um and their their hair is usually very well kept um and then there are like Econo wives, which are like the lower class catch all. They don't really have much agency to them. Um, and then we have, uh, prisoners or the unwomen who are, uh, wearing rags. Uh, they are working like, uh, Elizabeth alluded to earlier. They're working in this like, toxic wasteland yeah. in the colonies, colonies. that like, we don't get much explanation of wh how that came about or what happened um we have the ants like i was talking about aunt lydia earlier who essentially oversee train and discipline the handmaids um so essentially they're going turning against their own women um and then there are jezebels which i also touched on earlier who work in uh these secret brothels um that the commanders go to as well and they are uh, wearing what is like forbidden clothing. So clothes that we're currently wearing, essentially. Yeah. Um, so does anyone have any like initial thoughts on like what the role of women is or have an issue with them being categorized in a way that they're seemingly all the same? I was just, just to start because you were just talking about the Jezebels. Um, I think it's really interesting that the Jezebels, which are you know they're 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 the sex workers of this, they're the whores, they're the they have to stay, they can't leave this building, they have to be there. But like you said, they can wear their own cl or they can wear regular clothes. They are allowed to drink and smoke cigarettes. They are allowed to listen to music. Um, when they have uh, the character and I'm blanking on her real name, but June's best friend, um, Mora. Yeah. When they have her go there for the first time, you know she's talking about how hey at least she has most of her day to herself because she's allowed to do they're allowed to do what they want they don't have to clean or cook or whatever but then at night they have to just go and entertain these people and you know i mean especially they're not sex workers they're sex trafficking victims really because they're being forced into this they, they have no choice but to do it but it's interesting because in, i just think in a lot of societies historically like women courtesans you know back in the day actually got more rights they were allowed to read and get an education but also then they were kind of put in this special class of women where no one could actually treat them respectably and it's just interesting these trade-offs that in real life and in, in this show that they have where it's like okay well sometimes women are allowed these certain freedoms but only if we put them aside as some sort of like other kind of woman who's not really a normal woman yeah and they also allude to throughout the show that the way that women were perceived and treated before aka like what i interpret as like now for us was just um unkosher and just the women were uh dis are disrespectful and they essentially in this new society put women who were able to have children up on a pedestal so like they can do they can do wrong but essentially they're because there are so few that can conceive children at this point they kind of like like almost idealize them in this but they don't treat them that way yeah, like yeah. they treat them like cattle yeah basically. exactly they treat them like cattle but it's a way like they they value them it's benevolent sexism is i think what they mm -hmm. call this a lot yeah, yeah. 
when we see the flashbacks for Serena Joy, we see her as a very prominent author, and she goes on her diatribes about what she calls domestic feminism, which I'm not sure if I can completely articulate. Do you guys remember this? Yeah, I, I mean, because it's definitely a thing that you hear, yeah. especially f- in the 80s and 90s, but still from conservative women today, which is, yeah, this idea that, like, the f- true way that women can be empowered is by having to take away all these dangers out in the real world and all this stuff and if they but if they if they're the ruler of their home that's where women are really called to lead so it's sort of making it's same thing as with the him it's sort of making an empowerment out of being trapped i guess but but at, at the same time like the handmaids have like no power over their family they're, they're like the no. children they have aren't theirs they get ripped from them right right away so that they can go to like the the wives and the commanders um so which there's another interesting link to um a lot of hinting about events that are going on today that we see kind of highlighted in the show but um i really think another interesting part of like looking at the women is there some are like have this unquestioned devotion to this like i'm going to call it a cause like so the ants or the wives like their buy-in is so strong and i don't know if that's because like they're looking and they're like well at least i'm not a handmaid like i don't know if that's like their point of view but i I struggle because they do, you do see scenes where they're questioning like, oh, I'm not so sure about this or, but they never, they never seem to like come to fruition. Like it's just frustrating to watch, especially cause like a few, quite a few scenes with Aunt Lydia, like towards the end of season three when they um the there's a handmaid with um bars over her mouth or like metal so she can't talk and um june looks at aunt lydia and was like is this really what you want do you want the handmaids not to be able to speak now and aunt lydia's like well no but like uh like <laughs> so i think it's i think it's troubling that there's such such unquestioned devotion on behalf of the women um, I do think it's about a loss of status. It's much better to be a wife and it's maybe even better to be a handmaid than to be a Martha, depending on how you look at it. And um, But then to your point, Elizabeth, maybe have, being a Jezebel has its advantages because you do get your day to yourself. The clothing is so interesting to me because because it's so logical. It makes sense. If you're going to segment society and it's impossible to tell if somebody's fertile just by looking at them. So let's put them in a red dress. It's going to be easy to spot. And with the wings, they're not going to be able to see us, but we can see them. And I think that by making the people wear certain clothes, it's politicizing everyone's bodies. It's not just the handmaids or the Jezebels. I mean, I think Serena and Joy, who you brought up earlier, is is she's probably my favorite character. She's the most fascinating. And because, you know, she yeah, she had this whole high power career, but she was also one of the people who ushered in, who really helped usher in Gilead. I mean, they kind of it reveals as the seasons go on that more so than her husband, all the ideas everyone credits to her husband actually were pretty much hers. Mm-hmm. And she kind of wanted the society. But then, I mean, there's so many great scenes where it's like when the society actually gets realized and she finds out how few rights she's going to have, she's it's not what she wanted. But then she has to sort of convince herself that it was. I always think of that meme, the, um, I never thought the wolf would eat my face, said the man who voted for the wolves eating faces party. And I feel like that's what you have with a lot of the wives in, in this thing too, which is like, they kind of, you know, they went all in on this idea without realizing maybe what it meant, but now they're stuck with it. And so they have to convince themselves and even be more harsh sometimes to the, to the lower class women than they're, than the men are, because to really set themselves apart as no, like I'm not that kind of woman. Yeah. So what do we, while we're on the topic of um, womanhood, what do we think this show says about motherhood? Um, Because like going off of Serena Joy, so like Serena, um, when June slash (laughs) Offred was their handmaid, all Serena wanted was a uh, was a baby, and that's all she ever talked about. And um, she was very excited once um, June slash Offred was pregnant. But like, what is it? What is the? And there's a detachment that goes on as well. So what do you think the show is trying to say about motherhood? I wonder about Serena Joy's actual desire to be a mother, or if it's maybe just a craving of love in any form, the only times we ever see her smiling are when she's holding a baby, the time that her husband lets her drive. And um, yeah, I think those are the only times I can remember her smiling. But as June points out to her in the latest season, she doesn't, June doesn't think that Serena Joy is even capable of being a good mother that she... Yeah, she's not nurturing. Yeah. 
yeah, or maybe she doesn't even know what it means to be a good mother at this point because her sense of reality is just so warped. Well, if I think of like the idea, she was apparently writing these books and advocating for all this when this whole infertility crisis has started. And and she's she's totally like an alpha woman, right? Like she totally needs to be like even within this society, whatever the rules are, she needs to be the best at it. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like there was a whole thing where a lot of women couldn't have children. It was almost like a status thing, I feel like, for her. Not that she'd put it like that. The character thinks that she just loves children and motherhood is what women should want, so she wants it. But it's it almost seems like maybe there was an element of she was infertile. She felt bad about it because she felt like that's what she was supposed to do. And so, you know, she pretty much constructed a whole society to get over that. Yeah. I do wonder, I wonder if she's actually infertile though, or if it's just the husband. Yeah. I mean, we don't know that actually. Because in this society, yeah. men can't be infertile. I think it, the first season, or at first it, it implies at first that she is the infertile one. And then we learn later that, yeah, it's her husband definitely is. So maybe she's fine, but. I think it's also like if you contrast Serena Joy with June, for instance, like all of June's motivations are about getting keeping or getting her daughter, Hannah, keeping her safe. Then when she has the new baby, Nicole, um, it's about getting her out of Gilead. And then towards the end of season three, it's about getting all of the children out of Gilead and trying to save as many as possible. So like she is very driven by I don't know if it's I don't know if it's motherhood per se, but she's very driven by like the feeling that she the handmaids in particular are the ones who brought these children into the world and she feels some sort of responsibility to get them out of this like horrific scenario essentially um and one of my one of my favorite scenes actually was from the first season and it's when the like i guess the mexican ambassador came um and june is having June Alfred is having a conversation with her and ex- literally explaining very explicitly what's going on in this and Gilead, um, the like torture, the rape, all that kind of stuff. And the ambassador sits there and was and essentially was like, well, you know, there hasn't been a baby born in Mexico for six years. And that's like and essentially telling June, well, I don't care what's going on here. We need we need babies born like and it goes it cuts back and. Uh, the Mexican ambassador was like, June had overheard that they were trading the women for chocolate. Um, and June was like, uh, or the Mexican ambassador was like, oh, you know, my country is dying. And June just responds, my country is already dead. Um, so I thought that was like a very interesting contrast. Even And what was even funnier about that was that the Mexican ambassador was a woman. So she had like no, it seems like no sympathy, no remorse for the situation that was going on. And you think like an I mean, a logical person would have some sort of like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. I'm sorry. Um, but I thought that was one of the more interesting scenes, part, in part partially because the one in one essentially that had a choice to, like, stop this horrible regime was a woman. And she didn't didn't see an error with it because she thought her problems were just so much bigger than I the problems. That's one of the most realistic parts, too, mm-hmm. like the way that government leaders would respond if we had this sort of crisis. Like it, it's everybody's really progressive and, and woke or whatever when, you, you know, when things are great. But as as we have like scarcity of resources, in this case, childbearing women, like I think that's not that's one of the most realistic parts. And I don't think there's actually that many realistic parts of the show. But right. Right. Or I think more so that there's a lot of parts that make you think you're like, yeah. hmm, like this could be or even the because um, Canada becomes like a big yeah. part of the yeah. show too Canada's like the neutral zone yeah because Canada um and even I, I can't recall um a certain scene from the Can- uh, Canadian leader right now but I know like quite a few times they're like they're not necessarily condemning what's going on in Gilead which is kind of troubling they're just kind of like trying to s- calm the waters and like they let the commanders come visit and when they're harboring June's child um who's also Serena's child in in theory um they like don't necessarily want to give like give up who's hold or uh, who's housing the child but at the same time they they just don't want to create waves so like you said it's a yeah. neutral zone but at the same time then they're like essentially bystanders right so one thing that we're seeing more and more on the show is the lives of individuals after they get out of Gilead at the end of season two, we saw Emily, who is one of June's friend, leave Gilead to go to Canada. And she was declared uh, asylum st- status there and how kind of messy their lives are after. I mean, you can 
you we kind of expect it to be this warm, fuzzy, happily ever after re- reunited with their families and it's all wonderful again. But it's not that way. And I recall there's an episode in season two where Offred June is suddenly and unexpectedly reunited with her daughter, Hannah. And I listened to an interview with the producers and they said that for that scene, they decided to consult a refugee counselor to talk about what do these reunification processes look like. And we have heard a lot in the news that reunification is not, like I said, a happy ending all the time. It's quite messy. And usually the kids, um, and they show this in the show, are completely traumatized. And they don't know this person that is embracing them and hugging them and crying for joy. And we see that with Hannah. And I think with our current refugee problem in the United States and immigration crisis, I think the show is making that very clear parallel to where we are in this current day. Um, we see this with Emily when she's reunited with her wife and son. It's it's very uncomfortable. Nobody knows how to act. And Maura has this great line that she says to her that's not really about happily ever after. It's just about what happens after. And that's been something I've been thinking a lot about. And I can see a lot of that in the season the show creators and the writers really trying to make us take a second look of what's happening in our current day and see the parallels between what's happening in the show and what's happening in our country. Yeah. And I, I also think it's interesting because like, I, I also haven't read the book, but the, the book um, was written in 1985, I'm pretty sure. And I think if, um, and we got past the book by I, I, once season one was over, the book was was over. So, but Atwood still was um, a producer of the show. She was like doing a lot of heavy handed consulting and such, um, so that it represented what she thought uh, the book would have represented nicely. But I think it's interesting that. We've taken something from 1985, but there are some significant parallels. Um, Just the fact that uh, we're taking, we're ripping children out of mother's hands um, can be directly related to um, some of the stuff that we have going on at the border. Um, And I think, and that was even more prevalent when that, when those scenes were happening in the show. Um, And I think I was reading something earlier this week about how they're claiming that wasn't intentional. Um, but I, I have, I'd like to think it was somewhat intentional. Um, but I think like a larger question is, do you think this show is successful as a show because of the, because of when it aired essentially because of the political, political climate it entered? I mean, how many, I know when I, a few years ago when I was an intern on the Hill, I can't tell you how many people were protesting in the, in the, in these outfits. Like, and I think some people took it like rather seriously thinking that we were already living in this world, but I, I'm wondering if the show would be as successful or make as many people think if it wasn't set in today's political climate. I think today's political climate makes it maybe more successful than it would be. But I think that our culture loves a good dystopia novel. I mean, it was (laughs) The Hunger Games a couple years ago. I lived for that. Mm -hmm. And I think now there are – we have seen legislation around people bearing children, um, women's bodies. So I think that part – fits and probably makes it more poignant for people. But going back to um, what we're talking about with the refugee status of the people from escaping Gilead and going into Canada, one poignant moment for me when Emily escapes is that she doesn't even realize that she's made it to Canada. The men with guns approach her and she's still fearing for her life. And then she realizes that she's in Canada. She didn't even realize that she'd crossed the border. And the same thing happens with Commander Waterford when he's arrested for war crimes or perhaps not war crimes, but for crimes against humanity. And just the fact that they didn't realize that they were in a different country because there was no wall. <laughs> I thought that was poignant. <laughs> and then the process that we see Emily go through where she is receiving what appears to be really good um, health care and even mental health care. And that I thought was interesting and pointed. I think all the things everyone has brought up here, obviously there are many 
parallels or, or, you know, things that the impulses that we have now in our society, you can see how they also, you know, inform Gilead. But this is one of the things that the number one thing I would stress to people about this show is if you think that you don't want to watch it because it's this heavy handed political allegory, that's not true. Like it definitely stands up on its own as a piece of entertainment. Mm -hmm. I was really you know, reticent to watch it in the first place because of all those handmade protesters who were usually just sort of going over the top in their in their parallels they were drawing. And to this day, we still see so many people just drawing these sort of over the top parallels. And I think that's really maybe that has attracted people to the show, but I think it's also put a lot of people off the show because they think they're going to find something anti-Trump or anti-religion or anti-Republican or just whatever. And it's it's never had to be handed in those and those capacities, I don't think at all. I don't think it's necessarily intended. I mean, it was started before Trump was even elected. It wasn't ever intended to be that. They definitely play with things that are going on in the news, but it definitely just works as a great piece of literature, a piece of entertainment, a piece of dystopian you know, TV. I'll push back on that just a little bit by saying Margaret Atwood has said before that everything that happens in The Handmaid's Tale, the book, to women has happened sometime previously in history. I do think it was released in a very interesting time period. Um, again, I think it, and I'll agree with Elizabeth, I think it stands on its own as a um, piece of television and, you know, entertainment, uh, entertaining show. But I, I do find that the creators and writers tend to lean a little bit on the political climate around us. Yeah, I think so, too. And I think once they saw because I think the big protests that were happening where people were dressing up like handmaids um, happened between season one and season two. So once they saw the response there, I'm sure to them it was like, oh, this is like this is a moneymaker right here. And they're like, how many more things can we shove in? You know what I mean? So how many more parallels are I don't even call them parallels. I'm more so like nods, like they nod to certain things that are. Yeah, they, they're they nodding to certain things that are going on. Um but I still think regardless, like it's, it's, it would be a successful dystopian. We, like Marianne said, we love dystopias. We love like uh, almost science fiction. We're not really sure on the environmentalism part, but, um, we love stories like that. Um, so I think another kind of way people are like consuming the show is like a coping mechanism. But I was just reading like people's reactions because I was just curious, but different people were saying and they were saying they were using it as a coping mechanism when they read the book so they're using it as a coping mechanism for uh 34 years later for an administration they never imagined would happen um and mind you then i stopped reading this article but the, the fact of the matter is like i was like a coping mechanism for, for what like i just couldn't see i could i couldn't like you said like besides it if you think gilead is what is happening or we're on the verge of like it's it's just not true and it's not it's certainly not a reason not to watch the show um but yeah i think that's crazy yeah but (laughs) and i'll say we we had talked about before the show the fact that was it kylie jenner yes yes kylie jenner had i can't believe we're talking kylie jenner our producer is shaking his head on me um had a Handmaid's Tale theme party. I thought this was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, what? With under it his eye so cocktails. Happy. There was like punch. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, seriously? And they all dressed seriously? in red with the wings. Yeah. I mean, I don't think she's doing that as a commentary, so it's no. probably not hilarious. But it'd be, it'd be hilarious if it was commentary. Like, I want to dress as Serena Joy for Halloween just because everybody's always dressed in as the Handmaid's. Oh. And like, she's the villain, so yeah. it's more fun. But um, that's that kind of brings me to an interesting question. So you, do you think who, who do we think is the villain here? Or who do we think... Oh, it's so hard to say. Right. So yeah, she said so Serena, whereas I... She's a villain, I guess I should yeah. say. Or like... Because I think in a, in a lot of aspects, there could be multiple people who are the villains, right? Um, from Even con- June. Even June, right? So what, what made you think of Serena as one of them? I mean, she's clearly one of the villains. She is one of the architects of the society and everything. She's also just directly, you know, abusive to June for much of supposedly of the early show. But I mean, I think my two favorite characters are her and the guy that um June ends up living with in the last season. What's what's his Commander Lawrence. Commander Lawrence, played by Bill 
let's okay. Anyways, um, very famous actor. Yeah, very famous, <laughs> very famous actor who none of us are remembering right now his name. Um, but both of those characters seem to have some regrets about how Gilead has panned out, even though they were both instrumental in it becoming a thing in the first place. And so they're, I mean, actually neither of them are full villains or full like good characters. And and I think those that makes them the most interesting characters that they have this mix that's always sort of prevalent. When they introduced Commander Lawrence in, um, I was, especially towards the end of the third season, I thought he was an interesting character from the perspective he, they've painted him as the architect, right? The Yeah, he's made up the Gilead economy, up, they yeah. say, the architect of the Gilead economy. Yeah, yeah. so he's the architect, he's like the, uh, the man behind the scenes. Uh, making sure like this is how it's how the uh, republic is going to work and he refuses to take part in the ceremony until like it's absolutely clear that he's like kind of um <laughs> going against like the own rules that he made um partially because his wife is uh mentally ill to some extent it's unclear what um what exactly is wrong with her but um it's very interesting how June calls him out. So she's like, you've made, you've, you're the one who constructed all of this and you don't even believe, like, you don't believe it. Like, and he was like, well, it's what we had to do. It was like, it was almost like he was saying it was beyond my control. Yeah. And I, and I was just like sitting there. I was like, wow, this guy is just full of crap. <laughs> you just made me think of like, well, it looked good on paper, yeah. June. Yeah. <laughs> looked like it was gonna, everything was going to be okay here. He doesn't seem as villainous to me as some of the other characters, partially because we haven't seen him like torture anybody or hang anybody. Like we haven't seen that. But like, and on like you just said, on paper he should be like the most nefarious because he's the one who created the whole thing. Um, but I think he quickly realized, which is also interesting, that he had made a mistake. Right? He had or made many mistakes because now it's like trapping his wife as well. Um, because she, one, she can't get medicine, she can't get out. Um, but I think he, he is gonna have a, a bigger role the next season, I, I would assume. But I just think like how they're developing is quite interesting considering like you would expect the architect to be like, very gun ho and like this is how things should but, be done. Yeah. <laughs> As libertarians, I feel like like there's a very libertarian lesson in his character because exactly like he's just sort of like a bureaucrat who's sitting there on paper not thinking about how it affects people's lives and then when it does affect his own life negatively, it's like, oh crap, like I was wrong about this. But I think we you know, we that that's a real life parallel we see all the time oh, in yeah. many different ways. He's yeah. a frustrating character for me because he we see goodness in him. You see that he loves his wife. He helps Emily escape. He tried to help June escape. But then he shames June by making her wait on him in front of all the other commanders. And he's not a holy fool. He knew what he was subjugating women to. And so as much as I empathize with parts of his character, I just want to smack him. Same. <laughs> When you just, you know, you talked earlier about the ceremony and how they do that whole thing. They talk to tell the Bible story beforehand. And I forget who said it, but there's a scene where one of the one of the people with Fred and all the people who made up the rules of Gilead and they were talking about how do we get the wives to buy into this? Like, how do we get the wives to buy into us having sex with other women and, and raping other Why women? Does it always yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and he and he brings up that Bible thing and he's like, oh, we'll tell him this. And I remember the line. He said, the women will eat that up. And it's kind of interesting because it's like that's now one of the, you know, allegedly holy religious parts of their ceremony. And we see that scene where it's like, actually, they just made that up to sort of, you know. OK, this is going to be an incredibly unpopular decision. It's not what I think. This is what I think Margaret Atwood is thinking. The villain in this story is like all men. <laughs> I think there is like a very, very strong all men theme, even though we see several men in this story with many redeeming qualities. I think, um, you know, June's wife before Gilead was a total prince. Uh, but that being said, I'm not sure if there is villains in this story other than like, it's, it's more like there are people that have made several bad decisions <laughs> and people that have made less bad decisions, but each person is a product of the decisions they've made in this world. So I'm not sure. And I think the show works really well that way to like not give you a clear villain. Even earlier when we started, Aunt Lydia, uh, who seems to be all well intentioned, I can see her just kind of have gotten caught up in this system and you know she's a very persuasive person so she ended up in this role but i mean that that's kind of how an authoritative regime starts it's a very trickle down one inch at a time 
kind of thing. And maybe that's what makes the show so scary is that there's no clear black and white. It's a lot of gray that ends up to where we are. Well, the, vi- the victims are made to be complicit in, I think it's maybe the first episode of the first season where we see that the handmaids um, are responsible for executing somebody accused of a crime and they're made complicit and that happens over and over again. And Yeah, they have the, st- the handmaids stone uh, people convicted of rape I mean, and maybe other crimes, but that was like the, the scene. They're like, this guy's a rapist. Everybody stone him. Well, the last... The last episode of the first season, when the handmaids revolt and they refuse to stone Janine, it's such a visceral moment because they're holding the stones in their hands and they're they're just stones that you can hold in your hand. They're about palm sized and just thinking about like the physical um, reality of what happens when you stone somebody. You're throwing rocks at somebody. That is a crazy way to. I'm, it's just crazy. Yeah, I think. And a kind of another side point I was just thinking when we were talking about how authoritarian regimes like this are created slash continue, continue on. Um, I think part of it is like they don't want the handmaids to feel like they're innocent in all of this. Mm-hmm. So like if because if you're having someone in an oppressive regime like this think they're innocent, they're they're going to run to Canada and like, look what all these people are doing. But like in a, in a way, like making them execute people or making them participate it's from an out, uh, from an outsider's point of view they're going to be like you were like you were there too what why why didn't you do this so i think it's almost intentionally making them like guilty and making every i mean the whole thing is set up by people snitching on each other and stuff <laughs> just, yeah yeah which and is also perhaps an outlet for their rage yeah. in one of the early scenes when the handmaids are made to execute a man we see the look on June's face where she is, she's into it. She is ready to commit this violence. And that's one of the scary parts for me. Yeah. I want to piggyback off of that. And I think this past season, season three, they did talk, they did play on that theme a lot of like, what does captivation, what is living in this type of society do to a person's psyche. Mm-hmm. And again, kind of, I believe it was kind of commenting on current day of, you know, we're seeing people being held at the border. What does being captivated, being held in really bad conditions do to an individual when you deprive them of just essential rights? All right, so we're gonna play a little uh, a little game of who said what. Ooh, I'm ready. Um, I have I picked some of my uh, more favorite quotes, and um, we're gonna try and figure out who said them. And if you, it's bonus points if you can figure out who said when they said it. Are we racing? No, we're not gonna race. We won't race. All right, first one. I know this must feel so strange, but ordinary is just what you're used to. This may not be ordinary to you now, but after a time, it will. This will become ordinary. Aunt Lydia? Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. (laughs) Yeah, so Aunt Lydia said this in the um, pretty early on in the first season when they're in the... um, Red Training Center. Mm, the Red Center. The Red Center, yes. Yeah. Um, and I was kind of wondering, uh, I wanted to look into the statement more so because w- why does it seem like so chilling? Oh, yeah. I've got goosebumps right yeah. now with <laughs> you just saying that. I don't know. I think just, you know, I think it makes you look at your own w- politics aside, whatever space you're living in right now and like, what is my ordinary? It's very... Um, I don't know. And essentially, like, there's a top-down power creating your new ordinary in, in this case. Yeah. Well, I think it's scary because it speaks to how adaptable people are and even to terrible situations. And we do pretty much see that Lydia is right. There's not yeah. many people actively resisting in their day-to-day right. lives. All right. Next one. So far, all you've offered me is coconuts and treason. Hmm. I have no idea. Can we have a hint? Um, she is one of the villains sometimes. Serena? Yeah. Is that when she's being offered to go to Hawaii? Yeah. Remember, she was being offered to leave Gilead yeah. um, when she went to... Was that when Canada. she was in Canada? Canada. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's when we find out that the United States still exists, but it's just Alaska and Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> and Chicago? There's, there's They're always talking about the resistance fighters in Chicago. Chicago <laughs> is still a U.S. outpost. <laughs> Woo, like way to go, guys. Chicago, Hawaii, or Alaska. <laughs> Definitely not Chicago. So someone uh, already said this quote earlier today, but everybody's talking about happily ever after, but there's just after. 
I think it was Tess or Mora. 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 Yeah. yeah. And we talked about that earlier. Another one. It's their own fault. They should have never given us uniforms if they didn't want us to be an army. <laughs> June. Oh, yeah. That's I was going to say that earlier when you were talking about the different color of clothes. Yeah. That's one of my favorite lines. Yeah, me too. All right. Next one. Blessed be the Fruit Loops. Janine? No, it's that it's the woman who never speaks up in Canada once they cross the border and she hasn't like said anything until finally she's just eating Fruit Loops one day and she uses their their slogan, which is blessed be the fruit. Yeah. I love that. So great. she's her name's Erin. Um and I thought it was just funny because like they always talk about like have a blessed day, blessed be the fruit, like you were just saying. I just I could not stop laughing when she said that. I was like, all right, this is good commentary in here. All right, last one. The world can be quite an ugly place, but we cannot wish that ugliness away. We cannot hide from that ugliness. Mm. That could be so many people. That's hard. I don't know. I'm just going to give it to you. Okay. It was Aunt Lydia. Okay. And I believe it was in the second season um, when uh, June started to be a bit, a bit more combative. But I thought I just thought that quote was more interesting because it was at, at this point she was like well there's nothing we can really do about it like we're going to face the ugly head on and we're not going to try and fix it all right so after this discussion we have decided that this is actually not how the united states is and um it is in fact a dystopia and it might not be all that positive a dystopia but it, at the very least it makes us think and it provides very, very good entertainment. Um, and on that note, we're kind of just going to go around and say who our favorite character was. And, oh, well, is. The show is still ongoing. And we do not have any spoilers for the new season. It's far off. Uh, um, sorry. Um, we'll go around and say who our favorite character is and why. Marianne? My favorite character is Janine. I love that she just can't help but be honest sometimes. And she seems, ironically, the most sane because she realizes like no this is crazy this is still crazy it hasn't gotten less crazy and i just i'm not a mother but her devotion and her just desire to be with her child is touching uh i guess i said earlier already serena joy and captain lawrence the weird half villain characters <laughs> um but mara is also great mara is routinely fun and just like the kind of yeah she provides something good in there too a lot I don't like June very much. June's probably my least favorite character. Is that Why? terrible? I don't know. That's <laughs> that's a whole other hour. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think part of that, too, like, I'm not a big June fan either, but I think they made her, like, intentionally not yeah. a captivating, like, character. Right. She, like, she's clearly not uh, Katniss, right? right? If we're looking at right. other dystopians. Um, but which makes us help, which helps us to focus on the other characters as well. I think my favorite character is Myra. I, I also think she's a good reminder of like not only resistance but of like today's world like I think yeah. she, like there are quite a few times where I'm like yeah like when she's like she's like oh, you guys are crazy like I like how she is brutally honest and still like seems to have like a not brainwashed um, when she confronts Serena Joy when Serena Joy is so excited to see her daughter and she's like June's daughter yeah, yeah. and yeah. she just lets her have it I love it yeah same that's I like that personality <laughs> Um, my favorite character is actually Rita. I, l oh, I yeah. love the Marthas. I think I am so excited to learn more <laughs> about like the Marthas them. and their like underground um, collective of, you know, sneaking around and smuggling babies out of the country. I, I think they're a really interesting bunch of characters and I'm excited to see them develop in future seasons. The Handmaid's Tale may seem scary and oppressive. As you heard, it succeeds as a TV show because it really makes you think, as all good entertainment does. It's important to close on the note that the world really has gotten better for women, even if you may doubt if it has. Thank you for listening to Pop and Lock. Follow us on Twitter at Pop and Lock Pod and subscribe to us on iTunes. We look forward to unraveling your favorite TV show or movie next time. <laughs>